celebration this morning is hymn number 577. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing. I want to invite uh, David and Lethia Alexander to come at this time. Their children are with them, and they're bringing, uh, uh, they're bringing Haley Jean for baptism. If y'all would come on up here. So 
So I've been looking at pictures of you. <laughs> David and Lephi, I ask you on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, answer, I do. And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, answer, I do. And will you nurture Haley in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. If so, answer, I will. What name is given to this child? Come here, girl. Yes. Haley Jean, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May God's grace and mercy rest upon you all the days of your life. Amen. Now, David and Lethia, they take vows, uh, and they make a covenant and a contract with God, but they do it inside of a larger context, which means you have a part to play in Haley's life. And so do you. Do you renew your faith in God, place your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and place your whole trust in His grace for salvation, if so, answer, we do. we do. And will you nurture Haley in faith by loving and caring for her? And will you do all that is in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love? If so, answer, we will. We will. I invite you to turn to hymn number 191, Jesus Loves Me. Let us sing this together. of your life. Amen. You may be seated. who are retiring this year. As I call your name, please come forward and remain standing until everyone has been called. Ella Arnold. Ashley Coppage.
Avery Ellis. Kate Ellis. Rosemary Gross. Lily Ray Hinton. Jack Ivy. Sadie Jewell. Katie Kinnemer, Eli Land, Eva Land, Craig Lawrence, Emily Lorenz, Mary Hart McMillan, Susan Middlebrooks, Crockett Miller, James Mosier, Henley Parker, Caroline Pease, Vivian Rayfield, Katie Shaw, Carolina Sheffield, I hope that you will express your gratitude uh, to these who have faithfully served as an acolyte now for a number of years. For that, we are very grateful. Uh, and so I want you to, on behalf of the church, uh, please know how grateful we are for what you do. be seated. At this time, I would like our acolytes to come forward who will be consecrated today and their families. Anna Alexander. Hannah Alexander. 
Take thou the authority of an aqualite in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Knox, Amos. Knox Amos, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Sally Beck. Walker Brewer. Walker Brewer, take thou the authority of an aqualite in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Sammy Burricker. Sammy Burker, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the Church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. John Cowley. Whit Hightower. Wit Hightower, take thou the authority of an aqualite in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Gray Jones. Gray Jones, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. James Kilgore. James Kilgore, take thou the authority of an aqualite in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Lawson Mansfield. Lost in Mansfield, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Charlie and Riley Martin. Charlie and Riley Martin, take thou the authority of an aqualite in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Carly and Jenna Mayhew. Carly Mayhew, 
Take thou the authority of the Anacolite of the Church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. John Martin. John Martin, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Katie Ritchie. Katie Ritchie. Take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Charlie Norris. Charlie Norris, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Zach Shaw. Zach Shaw. Take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Sarah Pease. Sarah Pease, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Good job. Madeline Steele. Madeline Steele, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Carter and David Rump. Carter and David Rump, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Virginia Waldrop. Virginia Waldrop, take thou the authority of an acolyte in the Church of Jesus Christ. Serve his altar with devotion and honor. Amen. Clara Tebow. Part of what you should, I invite you to stand, guys, if y'all would. Part of what we do is we offer ourselves in service. That's part of what consecration is. And one of the ways that we, we bless this and we, uh, we seal it is through a prayer. So today you stand before God's altar, having been trained for the office of an acolyte, assigned to his holy altar service. I ask you now to make your prayer unto God asking for his grace to fulfill this office, so let us pray. Holy Father, thank you for the privilege that is mine as I am consecrated an acolyte. I commit unto you my best. Amen. Now I want to invite you to join me in prayer as well. O oh God, as we consecrate these who give of themselves, we pray, Lord, that this would be 
not just a time of service where they uh, give of themselves and worship, but what we pray also, God, is that this would be part of their journey with you, that this would be one of the many experiences that they have inside of this place where what they come to know about themselves is that they're loved by you, and at the same time that that becomes a source of strength for who they are. And we ask, O oh Lord, for you to bless them, for you to bless their families, we pray, O oh God. And not just for these that are up here at this altar, but for all of us, O oh God, as we seek to be obedient, as we seek to serve you inside and outside of these walls. We look for your help, and we look for your guidance, O oh God. And we offer ourselves as an act of worship. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Let us now worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Receive these, O God, your tithes and our offerings. Allow them to be multiplied in this church so that we may be able to further your kingdom and hasten your return. It's in your son's precious name that we pray. Amen.
our scripture passage from 2 Timothy chapter 4. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory and forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I welcome you once again to our worship services. Whether you're a member or a visitor, we're so very glad that you're with us. Please take a moment during the service to register your attendance using the red pew pad. And as you greet one another, I ask that the children come forward for our children's message. Good morning. There's nothing in there. It's all gone, isn't it? Well, I think here, I tell you what, I'll get all of it out right now. There's no more water. It's all gone. Do you know that? Well, you know, Mr. John just read something. He read about uh, that Paul was talking about his life being poured out as a drink offering. And in the Old Testament, they used to have a drink offering where they would pour out something all the way into something else. And guess what's left? Nothing. Nothing. That's exactly right. And that's a lot like when we serve. When we serve, we give of ourselves to the point that somebody else might benefit, but you know what? There's nothing left. And that's almost, that's like a drink offering. But, and, it, but it makes you feel good inside. It does make you feel good inside. You're exactly right. We're going to talk about that in just a minute, you know. So it's going to be part of the sermon. Well, Mr. John just read something about a drink offering. Well, I wanted to show you what that meant, because we really don't have drink offerings today, do we? No, not really, do we? Well, this, I, what I want to do is I want to pray and give thanks to God. I want to give thanks that He receives our offerings, even our offering of service, as this drink offering, okay? Can you bow your heads for me? All right, you ready? Oh, God, we give thanks for your love and your mercy, and we pray for these who sit with me. Watch over them, oh, God. Keep them safe. Bless them in such a way that they see their life in relationship with you. And that becomes uh, the largest influence in their life. That they see themselves this way. They see other people in light of that. And that they see their life as a life with you and a life of service in such a way that adds to somebody else. And for that, we are grateful. Watch over them, we pray. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. I know what.
Will you join me in prayer? Oh God, as we move now into a different part of our service, um, what we're mindful of is the text that was read for us. Uh, what we want the text to become is the gospel. So we, again, confess to you that there's not anything within us that can generate the gospel, that the gospel uh, comes as an act of your will. And, and so we open ourselves up to that this morning, and we pray for you to use the text in such a way that it becomes a means to an end, that it echoes inside of our ears and in our minds in such a way that what ultimately is left is something that gets buried deep down into our souls uh, in such a way that um, recreates and recreates from the inside out. For all of this, we are grateful. Uh, we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Tuesday week ago, I uh, attended a, a funeral, and that's not anything uncommon for us. Uh, at least in my profession, attending a funeral or officiating a funeral uh, is not every day, but it does happen uh, probably more times than not. And this was a little bit different because it wasn't necessarily someone tied to, to St. Paul. It was a friend of mine whose mother had passed away. Uh, she had lost a battle with cancer after a long illness. And uh, I didn't know his mother that well. I, I'd enter into her life very late, maybe within just the... the the last few years of her life, but I, but I knew her son, and I marveled at uh, her son because he gave the eulogy, uh, which I can only imagine how difficult that would be, and he began to talk about his life, and really in reference to his mother. He, uh, they, they were, were not strangers to tragedy. When he was one years old, uh, his father, her husband, passed away in a, in a car accident and so what he knew about his mom was this mom that raised him and at the same time was caring for his grandparents and, and he recalled just in different chapters of her life all the ways that what was witnessed bef before him was this woman that loved and cared for other people and and how she made a difference inside the lives of, of so many he of which being one and, and I Something just in the middle of the service, I, I was humbled by this. Just that that would be, I mean, that's, that was the message of, of Miss Meg. And at the same time, I, I felt uh, very honored just to be in uh, this simple, elegant service where a son was talking about his mother, talking about his parent. And when I left there, I, I, I left with a deep sense of gratitude and, and with a lingering question that I've asked of myself uh, since that day. What do I want to be remembered for? What do I want my legacy to be? I don't know if you've ever asked yourself that question uh, or wondered or pondered out loud about things uh, of legacy, things of, of what people will remember uh, you for. But I've wrestled with this. This is what Paul is getting at in the text. Now, he's not giving a eulogy, but what Paul is doing, he is, is the, the tone of the letter changes in verse 4, and he becomes very reflective. Now, you need to know something what's going on inside of Paul's life. Paul is writing to Timothy. We've been looking at some of the letters, some, some of the writings to Timothy over the last couple of weeks. Timothy was by far his best friend. He was much younger, he was sort of a mentor-mentee type relationship, and he's writing to encourage Timothy. Timothy now is in Ephesus, Paul is in Rome, Paul is in prison, and he's writing to encourage his dear friend. And, and for the most part, all of for, uh, First Timothy and Second Timothy have to do with that, but it changes here, and the tone of the letter becomes very reflective, partly because Paul knows that his end is just before him. There was a time where he thought that maybe he would make his case in front of the court and, and either be dismissed or, or to be acquitted, but he's, he's given up on that. He is accepting the fact that his time is almost up. And so naturally when that happens, anybody, not just Paul, becomes very reflective. And Paul is writing reflectively about his life. And if there's ever something to 
embrace as what a legacy might look like, you see it here. The first comparison that he makes is that he sees his life uh, as uh, a drink offering. Now, you've heard the children's sermon, drink offerings. We, we, most of us, that's not even in our vocabulary. You have to go back into the Old Testament, Genesis, uh, about chapter 35 to when we're introduced to, to, to uh, drink offerings. It was, it was a means of sacrifice. Now, most of us, when we think of sacrifice, we think of Jesus' atoning sacrifice. But there were a host of different sacrifices, not just atoning or atonement. There was one that was called a drink sacrifice, a drink offering sacrifice. And in Genesis 35, Jacob is returning back from his uncle's house, and he goes to a place called Bethel, which if you know anything about Bethel in the Old Testament, that's that's a a hot spot for spirituality where people find God at Bethel. And, And he makes his way to Bethel, and he recommits to God there. And then he makes an altar because sacrifice is worship. And he makes an altar of rocks, and then he takes this vat of wine, and he pours it out upon the rocks. He makes an offering. And Paul sees his life that way, a life that is poured out for the benefit of someone else. Paul is describing his life as this self-giving service, sort of like that wine that's being poured out. See, to give your life to something, knowing that it would be used for another's benefit, that is what it means to give this way, to have your life poured out as a libation, to pour it out as a drink offering. That's what happens when you serve. Now, in your bulletin, you have something that looks like this. as a life that pours well. It has to do with service. Service is where you give of yourself in such a way so that somebody else would benefit. Do you know why we have places for people to serve? It's not to occupy your time. It's to create an environment here so that regardless of how people have, in whatever levels of contact they have with St. Paul, they find a community here that is welcoming, they find a community here that is loving, they find wholeness, they find a place of hope. And there's ways that people serve. Some of it is is what I call structurally, and and there's a group of people called our nominations, and they, from time to time, will call different people at different times, ask them to serve, and as part of our structure, like HR, trustees, finance, and some of you are serving in that capacity now. But there's a whole other aspect and avenue of serving it's more hands-on where you do things around here so that people when they when they have any level of touching with saint paul they somehow connect that with jesus christ and so people who usher, they serve as greeters, they, they participate in our care ministry, which is when someone find, that goes through a season in their life where, where either they've lost a loved one or they find themselves in a, in a level of, uh, of difficulty, the care ministry wants to just hold in love. They might find themselves in Connect. That's another ministry that we have here. Connect is where we go outside of this place and we want to, people to, to experience what we call here St. Paul. And the truth is, we need you to do it. And you need to do it. There's something about giving of our life that not only is an uh, aspect of our faith, there's something about giving of your life where, where you create collectively, all of us together, this environment that invites people in. And we all need it. So we need you to serve, plain and simple. And that's part of our legacy. Not only that, he he talks about a life of faithfulness. Now, uh, in the text, it has this image of someone who's running a marathon, and and he's he's on the the last half mile. He's finished the majority of it. There's just a tad that's set in front of him, and he can see the finish line. And so Paul describes his life, not just as a drink offering, but this idea of finishing this course of faith that's left in front of him. And Paul can't separate faith 
from any other aspect of his life. It's a part of who he is. And so when he lives his life, he's living a life of faith. And he has this sense of hope that as soon as he crosses the finish line, there's going to be a prize waiting. Not just for him, but for all of those, all of us, who finish this course as well. I have to tell you something that is, uh, it is something I embrace and love. And it's something else that I embrace. And it's really a level of sadness. You know, I mentioned to you that I attend uh, uh, just a, a number of funerals. At different times in, uh, in the year, I get this wonderful, John does too, unique, intimate privilege to be with those who can see the finish line that's right before them. I cannot tell you the level of peace that comes with the person who's lived the life of faithfulness. They, they approach the finish line differently. Now, sometimes we don't have a chance to have those intimate conversations with those that are about to finish their course, but, I, but, uh, but then we talk about it as a family or as a group of friends. People who embrace this style of life, they finish their life differently. And they approach the finish line differently. Now, that doesn't mean there's not anxiety. That doesn't mean there might not be worry about passing the finish line. It's unknown. I understand that. I would be that way. But they approach it differently. They approach it with a sense of uh, assurance. And the people close to them, they witness it. What you do when it comes to creating a legacy of faithfulness matters. It matters to you, and it matters to those that you love the most. Paul knows what's about to happen, and he's going to cross that finish line with a sense of assurance. And then the last part, and this to me is so important in our day. Paul talks about part of his legacy, part of what he hopes to be remembered for is, is tied and wrapped around forgiveness. Now, not in 2 Timothy does he talk about receiving forgiveness. That shows up in Philippians. That shows up in, in Corinthians. There are other books that talk about where Paul is laying out and he looks back on his life and he sees the things that he has received forgiveness for. And, and, and those are, are worthy in and of themselves. But here he's talking about forgiving other people. Forgiving other people. Uh, he, he had every reason to hold a grudge. There were people that would enter into his life for a small season, and then they would leave. Sometimes they would quit. Sometimes they would betray him. And, and, and many of those experiences left him holding scars and scabs. He understands what it's like to be betrayed, and he would be fully justified to hold a grudge. But he chooses to let it go. See, there's something about forgiveness that is tied to a choice that you make and it's not dependent upon circumstances or what other people do. It's something that you do with God, regardless of what someone else does. It is actually one of the most godly things that we can ever do because, in order, because to love this way, to love yourself this way, to love God this way, to love other people this way, it's not dependent upon the circumstances. And God loves in a way that's not dependent upon circumstances. God, out of his goodness, chooses to love and to care and to forgive. And as people who follow Christ, out of a relationship with him, we model the same behavior. Now, there's something you need to know about forgiveness. You model a love that's not dependent upon circumstances, and it's very godly, very godlike. And within ourselves, there's not the ability to do it. 
save this. In order to walk down the path of forgiveness, that choice that you make to walk with God, it forces you to trust in Him. Which means that you have to rely on Him in that process. Now, if you're interested in this, if there's something in your life that, that's a struggle when it comes to other people, um, we, we, one of the reasons why we uh, log all of our sermons and our teaching, and we've taught and preached extensively on this, is so when people are ready to walk down this path, there are things that, are help, that can help them, and we have those. But at some point, it starts with a choice to trust that God will walk with us as we seek to love ourselves and love the world around us the way he does. And it's not dependent upon what other people do. See, here's the thing when it comes to legacies. If you wait to when you can see the finish line, and maybe where you know that those days or maybe just the times just before you, it's too late. In order to leave the legacy you want to leave, it begins now, regardless of your age. It begins now with living, with investing, with serving, with pouring out your life in such a way so that others benefit from that. It begins with the Greek walking step by step in faithfulness. It begins with embracing God's forgiveness and then allowing that to work inside of you so that with God you're able to forgive other people. The idea that thinks that we will wait till that one day when we'll be able to do it, it'll pass you by. That I promise you. What do you want to be remembered for? What do you want your legacy to be? I marveled at this woman named Meg, lost to history, but not to her family and not to her friends. What they saw was a sacrificial life that cared and loved for others so that they would benefit. What do you want your legacy to be? That's the question before the house this morning. Let's pray. Help us, O oh God, you know, often the things that matter most, we have a tendency to push it off until there's time no more. Grant to us the courage to embrace legacy as individuals, as a group and to work and to give and to love and to serve in such a way so that those close and that those far see a life that's poured out, see a life of faithfulness, and see a life of forgiveness. Work in us your works of grace recreating us, oh God, we pray. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. I want to invite you to take your hymn books, uh, our hymn of consecration, it's hymn number 399, Take My Life and Let It Be. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing this hymn together. Hymn number 399.
may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His face and His countenance and you rest in peace. Amen.